Hey everyone, uh, I think it's two minutes after the time and uh, people are still joining, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Ultra Learn uh, and Learn. Welcome to Ultra Lunch and Learn. Also part five of the seven part ATSDR Public Health Assessment Training Series organized by ATSDR, Office of Community Health and uh, Hazard Assessment or OCHA. My name is Jen Lee and uh, I'm OCHA's Associate Director for Science. I'm also the moderator as well as a co-presenter for today's webinar. Before we get started, I have a few house housekeeping items. First, this uh, webinar is recorded and the recording will be released to the public. As a matter of fact, two of the earlier uh, webinar from the same series have already been posted to CDC YouTube channel. So we're very excited about it, it looks pretty good. Um, therefore, all of the audience are muted during the presentation in order to avoid unnecessary potential noise during the uh, webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type in, uh, in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, we will answer all of the questions received in the chat box. After that, if we still have time, we will enable live qu questioning and answering. Um, and we will unmute you, you can mute, unmute yourself so that you can ask questions on the spot. For today's webinar, the topic is on polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbon or PAHs. Specifically, we will describe ATSDR guidance for calculating benzoyl A pyrene equivalents for cancer evaluation of PAHs. Our main presenter today is Dr. Greg Eulich, and I will be assisting uh, with answering and triaging questions. So uh, now let's welcome Greg. Greg? It's all yours. Thank, thank you, Jane. And um, good afternoon. I'd like to also welcome you to the fifth webinar in ATSDR's 22, 2022 Health Assessor Training Series. As Jane mentioned, I'm Greg Eulersh, and I will be introducing the agency's new guidance for calculating benzoate pyrene equivalents for cancer evaluations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. Uh, I'm an environmental health scientist and have been with ATSDR for now almost 35 years. Over this, time, over this time, I've been a health assessor, technical project officer, and now I am uh, in the Office of Community Health and Hazard Assessment, or OCHA's Office of the Associate Director of Science that Jane leads. I also want to acknowledge a couple folks. Uh, one is James Durant, who was part of our Exposure Point concentration team that lent his statistical and other expertise into helping to develop this guidance. And also um, on the panel today is Rebecca DeVries from Eastern Research Group, who has been uh, instrumental in helping us pull this all together and will be here to help us answer any questions that you all may have at the end. Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, great, thank you, Greg. My name is Rebecca and I'm a health scientist at Eastern Research Group or ERG. I've been working with ATSDR, specifically Greg and James, providing contractor support on several guidance documents for a few years now, including the one that Greg will be presenting today on PAHs. I look forward to the presentation and will be on the line at the end to help answer any questions. Thanks. Back to you, Greg. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate it. Okay. For today's webinar, we will begin with an introduction of ATSDR's guidance for calculating benzoate pyrene equivalents or BAP equivalents for cancer evaluations of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. We will then provide general background information on PAHs and BAP equivalents, including of an explanation as to why this class of chemicals is considered differently. After that, we will step through ATSDR's recommended approach for calculating BAP equivalents for screening purposes and then for exposure point concentrations or EPCs. Finally, we will discuss some additional considerations when evaluating data from PAH sites. Before we begin, we would like to provide a brief overview of some of ATSDR's recent guidance and tools that are available to help health assessors conduct public health assessments or PHAs. As you know, health assessors perform various activities during the PHA process such as developing a site conceptual model, screening environmental data against health-based comparison values, identifying exposure units, and calculating exposure point concentrations and doses. To help with these PHA activities, ATSDR has developed various 
guidance documents. One example um, is the Public Health Assessment Guidance Manual, which steps through the entire PHA process. This manual was recently updated from the 2005 paper version into a web-based interactive design, which was launched in April of this year and presented during the May 11th webinar of this series. Another example is the various exposure dose guidance documents that have been developed to supplement the Public Health Assessment Guidance Manual. These guidance describe key considerations for specific steps in the PHA process. This slide lists guidance documents that are relevant to this process of calculating exposure point concentrations, or as I mentioned, EPCs, for different sampling methods and specific to certain chemical classes. ATSDR has also developed various tools. One is Public Health Assessment Site Tool, or FAST, which many of you are aware of, which can be used to screen environmental data and calculate doses to evaluate cancer risk and non-cancer hazard quotients. Another example is ATSDR's new EPC tool, which is a web-based application for calculating exposure point concentrations. Uh, we are excited to announce that this new tool was launched today and will be featured in an upcoming June 15th webinar of this series, which will be this time next week. This tool implements all of the calculations for PAHs that we will be discussing today. Today, we are focused on ATSDR's new guidance for PHAs, for PAHs, excuse me. This document begins by providing general um, background information on PAHs. It then steps through, steps through ATSDR's recommended approach for calculating BAP equivalents using measured concentrations of PAHs to get a maximum PAH equivalent for screening and then a BAP equivalent EPC for estimating doses. The guidance also describes how to use the calculated BAP equivalents to evaluate cancer risk. Finally, the guidance outlines a sensitivity analysis approach that can be used to assess the impact of non-detect observations have on the estimated values and cancer risk cons conclusions. The methods outlined in this guidance are applicable to environmental sampling data in all media, including air, soil, sediment, water, and biota. The methods are applicable to data collected by sampling strategies, including discrete and non-discrete sampling approaches. Importantly though, the methods are only applicable to cancer evaluations. BAP equivalents do not apply in evaluations of non-cancer health effects. When non-cancer health effects for PAHs are evaluated, each PAH congener should be evaluated separately with appropriate and available congener specific non-cancer comparison values or health guidelines. This is different than the dioxin approach where both cancer and non-cancer can be evaluated with a relative toxicity approach. Before you sh we show you how to calculate BAP equivalents, let's step through some general background information on PAHs and why we use PAH equivalents for this particular class of chemicals. To begin with, what are PAHs? Well, PAHs are a class of many different chemicals. Pyrogenic PAHs are formed during incomplete burning of coal, oil, natural gas, wood, garbage, and other organic substances, including tobacco and charbroiled meats. While these predominate, there are other important sources for us to consider. The most important to health assessors are petrogenic PAHs, which are found in crude oil and petroleum products derived from crude oil, such as gasoline, diesel, coal tar, and creosote. Petrogenic sources include oil spills, leaking underground storage tanks, and petroleum releases. PAHs typically occur in these types of sources as mixtures of two or more compounds though they are not manufactured as individual compounds, for example, in, in producing dyes and pigments, pharmaceutical synthesis, and chemical manufacturing. They enter the environment mostly as releases to air from volcanoes, forest fires, residential wood burning, and exhaust from automobiles and trucks. They can also enter surface water through discharges from industrial plants, wastewater treatment plants, and they can be released to soils 
at hazardous waste sites if they escape from storage containers. As a result, PAHs are found all around us and are ubiquitous in soil, with urban soil tending to be higher concentrations than urban, uh, rural soils. PAHs are organic compounds with multiple aromatic rings that contain hydrogen and carbon. As an example, you can see chemical structures for the three well-known congeners on this slide. These include benzoapyrene, benzoanthracene, and naphthalene. In these images, each hexagon represents a benzene ring, which is drawn as a ring of six carbon atoms with alternating double bonds and single bonds. Benzoapyrene is shown with five fused benzene rings, while benzoanthracene consists of four and naphthalene is made up of two. Individual pH compounds like these are sometimes referred to as congeners, as I mentioned. These are more than 100 different, there are more than 100 different pH congeners. So why are we looking at pHs differently from other compounds or said in a different way? Why did ATSDR develop a guidance document specifically for this class of chemicals? First, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, pHs typically occur in the environment as mixtures. This explains why you often see a single environmental sample analyzed for multiple PAHs. For example, a soil sample might be analyzed in a lab for 16 different PAHs, pH congeners. Secondly, the PAHs found in these mixtures um, share similar toxic responses. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency and the International Agency on Research of Research on Cancer have classified various PAHs as human carcinogens or being probably carcinogenic. Because PAHs elicit similar toxic responses, and because we are typically exposed to PAHs as mixtures, we can evaluate them together. Specifically, we express the overall carcinogenicity of a mixture of PAHs as a single value, and then use this value in our public health, assessment, public health assessments to evaluate cancer risk. This is done by comparing the carcinogenicity of multiple PAHs to that of an index chemical. In this case, the index chemical is benzoapyrene. Benzo benzoapyrene is used as a benchmark for PAHs because there is a large body of toxicological data available for this particular congener and known frequent human exposure to it. Since benzoapyrene is used as the index value, that value is referred to benzoapyrene equivalence or short for BAP equivalence. So what are BAP equivalents? BAP equivalents are calculated to represent the overall, overall carcinogenicity of a mixture of PAHs by comparing the carcinogenicity of each individual congener to that of the index compound. BAP equivalents offer a scientifically defensible means of reducing mixtures of PAH congeners found in an environmental sample to a single value that can then be used for cancer evaluations in our public health assessments. How are BAP equivalents calculated? BAP equivalents are calculated with values called potency equivalent factors or PEFs. They have been developed for a subset of congeners that have very uh, have sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity. PEFs represent the relative toxicity of each congener compared to that of benzoapyrene. They are used to weigh the measured concentrations of each PAH, which are then summed to obtain a single value. The concept here is similar to the toxicity, the toxic equivalent factors that are used to collapse results from multiple dioxin and dioxin-like compounds into a single value. You can see how this works for pHs at a very high level in the image shown on the slide. In this image, you will see a stacked bar chart on the left with three segments shown in yellow, blue, and green. These segments represent measured concentrations for three different pH congeners. The measured concentrations of each congener are multiplied by their respective PEF to obtain a weighted concentration. You can see those weighted concentrations represent, represented in the same colors shown on the stacked bar on the right. 
the weighted concentrations are then summed to obtain a BAP equivalent. Looking at congener rep represented in green as an example, you can see that although this congener was measured at a higher concentration, it ultimately contributed the smallest amount to the BAP equivalent. This is because uh, this is due to its low PEF. Conversely, the congener shown in the blue was measured at a lower concentration, yet contributed a greater amount to the BAP equivalent. This is due to the congener's high PEF. With this approach, the weighted sum of PAHs end up e being equal to the same risk produced by benzo A pyrene. On this slide, I am showing you a table with PEFs that ATSDR recommends for calculating BAP equivalents. The table shows names, cast numbers, and PEFs for 25 PAH congeners. The PEFs shown in this table represent the relative toxicity or carcinogenicity of each congener to that of benzoapyrene. For example, a PEF of 0.1 indicates the congener is 10 times less toxic than BAP. A PEF of 1 would indicate equal toxicity to benzoapyrene. So for example, when you see a PEF for benzo AH pyrene is 10, we can say that dibenzo AH pyrene is 10 times more toxic than benzo A pyrene. Many of these PEFs, as well as the general approach for calculating BAP equivalents, come from Cal the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or OEAHHA. Of note, ATSDR recognizes that these are other, that there are other published PEFs available. For example, EPA developed relative potency factors or RPFs for a subset of PHs in 20, uh, 2003. ATSDR recommends the California values as they were published more recently, include a broader suite of PAHs and are generally more protective both in terms of the RPF values and cancer slope values factors. Health assessors should note that California OEHHA continues to review literature pertaining to the carcinogenicity and mutagenicity of PAHs. As such, PEFs may be derived for additional PAHs or existing PEFs may be modified based on new data. So how are these PEFs used? To keep it simple, let's start by walking through the approach to calculate a BAP equivalent for a single sample. The first step is to calculate what is referred to as a congener specific BAP equivalent concentration or BEC. The intermediate calculation is done for every measured congener that has a PEF. The formula for calculating congener specific BECs is shown on the slide. For each congener, you multiply the measured concentration of the congener by the congener's PEF. The next step is to use the congener specific BECs to estimate the total BAP equivalent for the sample. The formula for this step is shown on the slide. The BAP equivalent is calculated as the sum of all of the estimated congener specific BECs for that sample. For example, if you had measurements of 10 PAHs and all of those PAHs had PEFs, you would sum the 10 congener specific BECs to arrive at a total benzoapyrene or BAP equivalent concentration for that sample. To illustrate these calculations, let's step through a very simple and hypothetical example. On the slide, I am showing you a table with measured concentrations, PEFs, and congener specific BECs for four PAH congeners. Looking at the first row, we see that the benzo A anthracene was measured at a concentration of 50 micrograms per kilogram and has a PEF equal to 0.1. The BEC for this congener is calculated as a product of these two values, which is equal to five micrograms per kilogram. This same calculation is completed for the following three congeners. At the bottom of the table, you can see the BAP equivalent for the sample. This value is calculated as the sum of the four congener specific BECs. These values are 5, 100, 20, 15, which sum to 140, 
the BAP equivalent is therefore reported as 40 micrograms BAP per kilogram. With this simple example, you can see that BAP equivalents are weighted sums of the individual congeners with, with weights based on the congeners specific potency relative to BAP. Another way to consider the result from the sample shown here is exposure to the measured concentrations of the four different pH congeners is equivalent to exposure to, to 140 micrograms BAP per kilogram. Now let's go over ATSDR's recommended approach for calculating BAP or benzoapyrene equivalents for cancer calculations in our public health assessment documents. BAP equivalents are used in two steps in the overall public health assessment process. The first is for screening and the second is to calculate exposure point concentrations or EPCs for a given exposure unit to calculate cancer risk. Importantly, BAP equivalents are calculated differently depending on whether you are determining a maximum or screening for, for screening purposes or for calculating an EPC. On the slide, I am showing you a flowchart that outlines at a very high level how to use BAP equivalents for cancer evaluations in a public health assessment. First, you calculate a total BAP equivalent for each environmental sample collected within the exposure unit. This means that you'll have as many BAP equivalents as you have samples. If there are 15 samples collected, you will need to calculate 15 sample specific BAP equivalents. Next, you will compare the maximum sam sample specific BAP equivalent to the appropriate cancer comparison value. If the maximum BAP equivalent is below the cancer comparison value, you may conclude that the measured concentrations of PAHs within that exposure unit do not pose a cancer risk. If the maximum BAP equivalent is above the cancer comparison value, you will need to calculate a BAP equivalent EPC and then use that value to further evaluate cancer risk. Let's look at this process a bit more closely, beginning with the screening step. During the PHA process, health assessors must screen maximum detected concentrations against applicable comparison values or CVs for all identified potential or completed exposure pathways. Again, for cancer evaluations of PAHs, health assessors should first calculate a BAP equivalent for each environmental sample collected within the exposure unit. During this process, health assessors will often encounter non-detect observations, which are pH concentrations that are too low to measure with confidence. As a conservative approach during the initial screening step, ATSDR recommends that health assessors use the full detection limit when calculating BAP equivalents. That means that non-detect observations should be substituted with a value equal to the full detection limit when calculating sample-specific BAP equivalents. Let's walk through an example of how to calculate a BAP equivalent for screening, which is similar to the example that I showed you before. For this example, imagine that we have a data set with results from 10 samples, each of which were analyzed for seven PAHs. I'm showing you the results for one of those samples in the table on the screen. The first column lists the PAH congeners, the second provides the congener PEFs, the third shows the measured concentrations for each PAH, and the fourth presents the calculated equivalent concentration or BEC for each congener. To start, we calculate the BEC for each congener by multiplying the PEF by the measured concentration. For the first congener, benzo A anthracene, PEF is 0 0.1 and the measured concentration is 60. The BEC is equal to 0.1 times 60 micrograms per kilogram or a value of six micrograms per kilogram. For the second congener, benzoapyrene, the PEF is one and the measured concentration is 100 micrograms per kilogram. So the BEC is just one times 100 or 100 micrograms per kilogram. Note that for the last congener listed, adeno-123-CD pyrene, the result was reported below the limit of detection. Because the limit of detection was 60 micrograms 
per kilogram, we multiplied the PEF of 0 0.1 by 60 to get a BEC of 60 micrograms per kilogram. The next step is to calculate a sample BAP equivalent by summing all the BECs. Here, we arrive at a simple BAP equivalent of 200, and, excuse me, we arrive at a sample BAP equivalent of 258.1 micrograms per kilogram. You can treat this entire process for the uh, other, you can, excuse me, you can repeat this entire process for the other nine samples collected in the exposure unit and identify the maximum BAP equivalent across the 10 samples. Once we have determined the maximum BAP equivalent, we can treat that chemical just, just the same way as other chemi individual chemicals in the screening process. An important reminder here is that BAP equivalents are only applicable to cancer screening values, as I mentioned before. That means that you should compare the maximum BAP equivalent against the Cancer Risk Evaluation Guide or CRAG for benzoylpyrene. Here, if the maximum BAP equivalent is below the CRAG or comparison values, the measured concentration of PAHs do not pose a health hazard for cancer. If the maximum BAP equivalent is greater than the cancer comparison value, you need to further evaluate cancer risk. More specifically, you need to calculate an EPC to estimate dose. Please note that when cancer effects for PAHs are evaluated, each PAH congener should be evaluated separately with appropriate and available congener-specific non-cancer CVs or health guidelines. As I mentioned before, calculating BAP equivalents for EPCs requires a slightly different process. For this, health assessors first need to calculate an EPC for each measure, measured congener using data from all of the samples collected within an exposure unit. The process for calculating congener-specific EPCs for PHs at this stage is just the same as any other chemical. When working with discrete sampling data, the EPC for each congener will, will be either the 95% upper confidence limit around the arithmetic mean, or known as the 95 UCL, or the maximum detected concentration, depending on the sampling method number of samples, number of detected results, and the distribution of the data. When working with non-discrete sampling data, that would be composite sampling or incremental sampling methodology data, the EPC will either be the mean or the maximum result, depending on the number of samples that you have. Details on how to determine the appropriate EPC are provided in ATSDR's EPC guidance for discrete sampling and ATSDR's EPC guidance for non-discrete sampling. Once, once health assessors have calculated an EPC for each of the congeners, the next step is to multiply each EPC by the PEF for that congener to obtain a BEC for each congener. Finally, sum the congener-specific BECs to arrive at a total BEP, BAP equivalent EPC. Importantly, this approach is different um, then ATSDR's recommended approach for calculating EPCs using a toxicity weighting scheme for dioxin and dioxin-like compounds, congeners. This is because the statistical considerations that are specific to this class of chemicals, particularly the frequency with which elevated non-detects occur in PAH data sets. ATSDR's guidance for dioxin and dioxin-like compounds recommends the use of the Kaplan-Meier statistic to estimate EPCs on a per sample basis, which doesn't perform well in this situation with BAP. The approach described here for PHs helps to ensure that non-detect observations are treated appropriately. Let's step through an example of calculating a BEP equivalent for an EPC. On the slide, I'm showing you a table with seven PAH congeners listed in the first column. Next to each congener, I am presenting the EPC statistic type and then the EPC value for each congener. The EPC values for each congener are multiplied by the congener's PEF value to calculate the congener specific BECs. Those values are shown in the last column on the table. As an example, look at the first row in the table. 
In that row, you will see that the EPC for benzoa anthracene is based on the 95 UCL and equal to a value of 125 micrograms per kilogram. That value is multiplied by the PEF for benzoa anthracene, which is 0 0.1, to get a BEC of 12.5 micrograms per kilogram. After calculating the BEC for each congener, the last step is to sum the BECs to arrive at a BAP equivalent EPC, which is in this example, 519.1 micrograms BAP per kilogram. The EPC pH equivalent can be used as the EPC to evaluate cancer effects following the approach in the Public Health Assessment Guides Manual. This involves calculating a BAP equivalent dose from the BAP equivalent and then using that dose to estimate cancer risk. To, to calculate and to evaluate cancer risk, ATSDR currently recommends using the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments oral cancer slope factor for benzoapyrene, which is 1.7 milligrams per kilogram per day. ATSDR similarly recommends California's inhalation unit risk for benzoapyrene, which is 1.1 times 10 to the minus three micrograms per meter cubed or 0 0.0011 micrograms per meter cubed. To help streamline the process for evaluating cancer risk for pHs, ATSDR has incorporated this, this approach that I just presented into several of its tools. Specifically, health assessors can use the agency's new EPC tool, which I mentioned to you was launched today, to calculate maximum BAP equivalent and BAP equivalent EPCs. For this, you simply need to load the data into the data import tool, and then the application will automatically calculate these values and provide them in a format that can be readily important, imported into PAHs. And I encourage you to attend the webinar a week from today, which will go through this process in more detail. Health assessors can then use FAST to screen maximum P BAP equivalents against the appropriate cancer comparison values and to estimate dose and cancer risk for BAP equivalent EPC. For this, FAST applies the California oral cancer slope factor and inhalation unit risk for benzoapyrene along with the appropriate age-dependent adjustment factors. Now that we have a basic understanding of ATSDR's recommended approach for evaluating PAHs for cancer risk, I would like to discuss a few additional considerations when working with these data. The first, the first case that in, um, in which one of the PAH congeners is in a data set that has all non-detect observations. When we talked about BAP equivalence for screening, non-detects were treated as equal to the limit of detection. However, when calculating BAP equivalence for the EPC calculation, non-detects are treated differently. If there are no detected observations for a given congener, health assessors can't calculate the EPC for that congener. This means the congener is excluded from the BAP equivalent calculation entirely. While that may be appropriate, it is important to evaluate the potential influence the non-detect pH congener or congeners have on the cancer risk estimates before coming to that conclusion. To do this, ATSDR recommends conducting a sensitivity analysis. This is done by first evaluating an upper bound BAP equivalent EPC. Then if the upper bound BAP equivalent EPC indicates a potential health hazard, evaluate the lower bound BAP equivalent EPC. By comparing risk estimates from these two values, you can get a sense of how much the non-detect PAH influenced the final risk conclusions. I will step through this of calculations at a high level today, but I encourage you to refer to the guidance for more information. Specifically, refer to figure one on page 16 of the guidance, for a decision tree that steps through this entire process. And I also would direct you to Appendix B for a detailed example of how to conduct this analysis. Um, I, 
Finally, I should also mention that ATSDR's new EPC tool provides upper and lower bound BAP equivalent EPCs whenever it is warranted. To calculate the upper bound or worst case BAP equivalent EPC, you would set the EPC value for the non-detect pH congeners to the full value of the detection limit. EPCs for other congeners should be either the 95 UCL or maximum detected concentration, consistent with ATSDR's guidance for estimating EPCs. Health assessors should then calculate the upper bound BAP equivalent EPC based on all the congeners and estimate cancer risk and FAST to determine the potential for cancer health effects. If the cancer risk is estimated at a value less than or equal to one times 10 to the minus six, there is no cancer hazard and your evaluation is complete. If cancer risk is estimated at a value greater than one times 10 to the minus six, conduct a toxicological evaluation following FAGM guidance to further evaluate the potential for harmful effects. If that toxicological evaluation indicates that there is no hazard, your evaluation is complete. Otherwise, continue with the sensitivity analysis to calculate a lower bound BAP equivalent. To calculate the lower bound BAP equivalent EPC, start by setting the EPC value for all non-detect pHs congeners to a value of zero and continue to calculate the BAP equivalent EPC as I described earlier. If the cancer risk is estimated at a value less than or equal to one times 10 to the minus six, the conclusions from the upper and lower bound BAP equivalent EPCs conflict. This suggests uncertainty in the EPC value and corresponding risk, cancer risk determination due to the non-detect observations. When this, occur, health, when this occurs, health assessors should report the range of cancer estimates from the upper and lower bound EPCs and discuss the related uncertainty. If the cancer risk is greater than one times 10 to the minus six, conduct a toxicological evaluation with this value and compare the results. Please note that this process is, as I mentioned to you, further described in the guidance in a decision tree and in an example in the appendix. As a reminder, upper and lower bound BAP equivalent EPCs are provided in ATSDR's new EPC tool, as I've already mentioned. Another important consideration that deserves mention here is how to treat naphthalene. Naphthalene should not be included in the BAP equivalent for screening or for BAP equivalent EPC calculations when evaluating cancer risk. This is because naphthalene is not mutagenic. pHs that have PEFs and are included in the BAP equivalent calculations are mutagenic. Because BAP equivalents are considered mutagenic, and evaluate it with age-dependent adjustment factors and FAST, it would be inappropriate to include naphthalene in those calculations. Instead of including naphthalene in the BAP equivalent, there is enough toxicological data for inhalation to evaluate it by itself without needing to estimate a, its relative potency relating to, in relation to BAP. Um, however, please note, that the evidence for carcinogenicity of naphthalene via the oral route is very limited. Therefore, for cancer, naphthalene should only be evaluated for the air pathway. Finally, naphthalene should be, as I mentioned, evaluated separately, the same as any other chemical considered in the public health assessment. Maximum detected concentrations should be compared with the cancer comparison value for naphthalene, and if appropriate, cancer risk should be calculated using the um, inhalation unit risk for that congener. Finally, it's important to note that not all PAH congeners have PEFs. In many cases, this is because there's not enough evidence of carcinogenicity to assign a PEF for a specific congener. The International Agency for Research on Cancer and EPA characterizes some of these PAHs as not being classifiable as to the carcinogenicity in humans. Health assessors do not need to worry about these pHs being excluded from the BAP equivalent uh, calculations for cancer evaluations. 
For other congeners, the, Inter the International Agency for Research on Cancer and EPA identifies the PAHs as a possible or probable carcin carcinogen. When working with measured data for these pH congeners, the presence of these congeners should be noted in the public health assessment, along with a note about any evidence of possible or probable carcinogenic effects. Health assessors should note that these are excluded from the cancer risk calculations based on the BAP equivalents and acknowledge the potential limitations. This is particularly important because none of the PAHs have oral cancer slow factors or inhalation unit risk values and FAST, and therefore wouldn't be considered as individual congeners in a public health assessment. In closing, ATSDR has developed guidance for calculating BAP equivalents for PAHs. This approach can be used to reduce environmental data for, pH, for many PAHs to a single value for use in our health assessment work when evaluating cancer risk. BAP equivalents are useful for screening the risk and for calculating EPCs if screening indicates further evaluation is necessary. Importantly, BAP equivalents are only applicable for cancer evaluations, as I've mentioned. Health assessors must evaluate non-cancer effects for PAHs separately on a chemical by chemical basis with appropriate and available congener specific non-cancer CVs or health guidelines. So with that being said, thank you for listening and we will be glad to take any questions and there may be some in the chat already. Great, thank you so much, Greg, for the, uh, for the very thorough webinar and presentation on the pH guidance. Uh, yes, we have received one question from the chat um, uh, from Shuang Ying. Um, the question is regarding substituting non detects, which type of detection limit do you recommend? Uh, would that be instrument detection limits, method detection limits, or reporting, minute, uh, reporting limits? Um, you know, I'll respond and uh, Greg can chime in. Uh, the, our guidance is uh, you know, recommending replacing you using full method detection limits uh, in this scenario. Um, but, and I also put a link to the full pH guidance on our, in the chat box. So feel free to bookmark it and go to this guidance for many detailed information on all the contents that's in today's webinar. Uh, Greg, do you have anything to chime in on the detection limits? No, no, that's that's correct. The the full method detection limit is what we recommend for substituting. Thank you. So I think that's uh, so that's the question that we received. So if you uh, have any question that you would like, you would like to ask Greg and any other panelists, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, we will unmute you so that you can ask question. Wow, today it's uh, maybe we, maybe we re, maybe we presented everything so clearly. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Um, as I mentioned, you know the uh, the the entire guidance uh, guidance is available on our new web wagon uh, with the link with the post in the chat box. And uh, you know, it's um, uh, the the web faculty has a lot of information on it, especially in, in the resource pages. Many of our our presentation and the webinars are are pre prepared based on the published guidance. So uh, feel free to to bookmark this page and uh, and go to that and use it as a resource for all of your work. Yeah, and while we're waiting, if there's any more questions, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, there is one person with their hand raised, so I will call on them. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Bhagwan Agarwal uh, from Pennsylvania Department of Health. Uh, so, Greg, thanks for the you know, wonderful presentation, and uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Thank so you. First, yeah, question I have is, when you do the this cancer evaluation, and you said, if, if it is crossing uh, more than one point, uh, one in 10 is to six, 
you do the toxicology evaluation. So do we need to do like specific cancer, any type of specific cancer, these individual compound, or we should do, look into the combined cancer risks? Well, yeah, you should, you should look at, because you're basically combining all the pH congeners and, and, and basically boiling them down to a cancer risk in relation to BAP. So when you look at, when you do your further toxicological evaluation, it should be related to BAP cancer risk. And um, if I completely understand your question, you should also look in the um, FAGM um, one section in-depth tox evaluation. It goes into several different factors that one would consider once you have a cancer risk above one times 10 to the minus six, it's not necessarily a hazard right away. There are some things to consider beyond the number. And I would point you to those factors within the uh, guidance. I'm not exactly sure that was your full question, but a little extra information. Yes, uh, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, but but my, my next question was regarding individual, these BA, uh, you know, BAP's compound. Uh, like, do we need, to look into the the uh, individual BAP specific cancer or no? Or just no. go. Okay. Just just go for just look at BAP, not the individual um, congeners that made up the the total mixture there. Because, uh -huh. you, like I said, you are boiling it down to the BAP equivalent, uh -huh. and it's really BAP that you should be further analyzing, okay. not not the not the congeners that went into it. I'll, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yes, you're welcome, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we actually just while while you were answering question, uh, uh, almost an identical question was entered into chat. So I think you answered that fully already. So uh, we'll go to the next question uh, from Daniel. How would uh, how should the additional pH be addressed if they do not have criteria? Every heavy pH release is a complex mixture, consists of hundreds of pH compounds. So I think this probably is a follow-up with what you have just. Uh, yes, some, described. some, somewhat. Um, but I think, I think he, I think Daniel's maybe talking about some of the other um, pHs that are maybe ones that don't have um, oh, uh, PEFs. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, that issue. Um, um, is an important one, and one of the reasons why we included in the in the guidance on table two, there is a list of other PAHs, and and they may not be hundreds of them, but there's ones that have at least some information from the various organizations that classify cancer as to whether or not they're considered not classifiable as cancer, probable, possible, or human carcinogens, um, which can help you guide sort of a qualitative evaluation that would then supplement your quantitative evaluation that you would do based on our guidance. Um, so, you know, if you were, that could be one of the factors I mentioned before, and that does tie into the previous question a little bit, is if you're, you have a, a certain risk and you wanna take a look at some other factors to weigh whether or not you think that's a hazard or not, you know, this could be one of the factors. If you have a lot of PAHs that we don't have any can, any PEFs for, but there are, there are considered possible or probable human carcinogens, and there's they're pretty high concentrations. That may be a qualitative thing that helps you decide. Hey, based on the quantitative piece and based on this and other factors, we think it's a hazard. Thank you, Greg. Any other questions? Okay, uh, calling ones. <laughs> I was, uh, wh while we're waiting, well, maybe there'll be another thinking. I just wanted to reiterate, I know I said this on the presentation, but um, so, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff that we presented to you today, but the, the good news is that um, next week, we will show you the EPC, the new ATSDR EPC calculator, and, and much of this will be done for you. This, all of this guidance here is what informed the, uh, the EPC uh, tool, at least for the PAH part. Um, and so you won't have to worry about this too much, but it's also, it's also good to know what goes into those calculations. You'll still have to make some decisions about uh, when you have a sensitivity analysis and, and look at the toxicological evaluations further and, and all that kind of um, part of the evaluations. But at least a lot of these calculations 
will be done for you and you won't have to worry about it, but you at least know what, what went into to getting your, your final number. Yeah, thanks, Greg, for, for promoting our talk next week. And yes, uh, <laughs> yes sure. I, I think, you know, what we are trying to do is provide the, the reasoning behind the tools that we've de developed so that you understand how the numbers are derived when using FAST. So hopefully yes, this can right. be helpful. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, Daniel oh. has another question. Say, does ATSDR have uh, Kaplan-Meier training? Um, I, Daniel, I'm not aware of any. It's, um, it's really a good statistic, as, as you are well aware. Um, we can run that by, like I mentioned before, that Jim Durant is not uh, on the call, and um, he is really the sort of our statistical guru, if you will, uh, to assist us here. I don't think we have any training planned, but I will pass that along to him, and uh, we can see what, uh, what we can do. Yes, and I, as I mentioned, you know, early on, uh, Ocha has regular lunch and learn uh, on a monthly basis. So, uh, um, you know, this this is a great 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 question. Uh, we can check with Jim to see if that's something that he could do that we can potentially arrange for future lunch and learn um, just on the yep. statistical analysis. So that's yes. that's a great question. Thank you. And I also would add one other thing that um, the the Kaplan Meyer use within this realm of of calculating equivalence for dioxins, for example, was, was a subject of a paper by Dr. Dennis Helsel, which is referenced in this, in this guidance and also in the dioxin guidance. And Dr. Helsel is now retired, but he was pretty well-known environmental statisticians. And he has several different trainings that are up on the, what's called practical stats. Um, I think he's got a lot of recordings of different trainings and he may have that one up there, but I'll check with Jim to, to make sure um, and also, you can look back at that reference for Helsel. I think it's Helsel 2012 that's in the uh, reference in this guidance. And that will give you some more uh, information on the basis for using the Kaplan Meyer in this process. Okay. Great, thanks. Yes, yes, the, uh, the method is not easy to use without training. So I, mean, yeah. I, I feel the same way because I cannot do it myself either. We have to rely on our, our really very awesome statistician, uh, Jim and others help in, in this kind of analysis, so. Yes, well, we will follow up for sure. Thank Thanks. you, Daniel. Okay, um, and I do want to mention that, that, um, um, that you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, for those who may miss some of the earlier training, um, two of the training are now posted on CDC YouTube channel. So if you go to CDC YouTube channel or you just go to YouTube and uh, Google CDC and FAST and CDC and FAGM, you should be able to find those, uh, those are full uh, webinars um, and um, you know, every single minute of it. Um, if you need a link, shoot me an email and uh, I'll send it to you afterwards. Uh, so ultimately, we do plan to have all the seven parts of webinar on, on the YouTube channel um, so that it will be broadly available to everyone. Um, yes. And also, too, um, I would state that, that that's sort of an interim step in our total planning. Um, um, uh, many of you may know Sandra Lopez, but she is our training coordinator. Um, and she is developing a website that will um, show all the different training and um, different kinds of uh, training things that we have. And these webinars that were recorded will eventually be uh, posted there once that is launched. Yes. Okay. Well, I think um, we're near the end of our time. We thank you all for participating in this webinar. And we know that we have to change the date and that may create unnecessary burden on all of you. So uh, super happy that you made it here, that you, ca you caught a new date. And we want to thank Greg and uh, you know, for your awesome presentation. Uh, thank Rebecca for many, many hours behind the scene, helping us you know, putting this together and Zach's uh, logistical support. So um, we hope you all have a great day and uh, hope to see you next week for the next one. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.